All right, well, thank you. And thanks to the organizers for this uh, really cool opportunity. I don't know how many answers I'm actually going to give you, because for, in science, what really thrills me and still thrills me are the unanswered questions, the possibilities. Um, when I was a kid growing up, I was really into sci-fi and cyberpunk uh, media, and I was one of those real geeks. Uh, and this really comes from this fundamental interest of mine in how living things work, and technology, wires and, and circuit boards and things like that. And uh, growing up that way, it's been really interesting in the last few years to see this, uh, the convergence of several movements, right? DIY bio, which I'll talk about in a minute, uh, the maker movement, and uh, sort of hack, hacker ethos, hacker movements, uh, good or bad. Uh, coming together, and what's interesting is now people are going home or getting together in physical spaces or virtually to set up their own labs in their garages and in their, in their basements um, by building their own equipment, buying DNA online, it's all very accessible now. And this is really interesting because citizens are getting involved in science directly. And I think, well, my lab, we try to participate in this as much as we can as well. Um, and I just want to highlight, you know, the latest uh, issue of Make magazine, which is pretty mainstream now, uh, has this high, uh, special section on punk science, DIY science. Okay, so DIY bio, biohacking, uh, these terms mean a lot of different things to different people. I think if I make a very broad generalization, biohacking is, is thought to be or talked about as manipulating an organism's genome, manipulating the DNA or the code. Uh, which governs the operation of this cell or whatever. Um, and the, the obvious and very literal, ana literal analogy is to computer code and computer hacking, right? So we call this sort of, I'm trying to draw a parallel here to digital hacking. I'll just give you one example from my lab where we took some human cells, we engineered um, fluorescent uh, protein into them. Well, actually, we took the DNA of a, from a jellyfish encoding for a protein which emits green light. Um, and then we grew these things, and we stably incorporated this DNA into these cells, and then we grew them onto little Lego men as, as green skins, right? So we've repurposed these cells, which aren't skin cells, uh, as a, an artificial skin onto an artificial surface using genetics and, and some surface chemistry uh, to create these um, monstrosities. And <laughs> My work has always sort of bridged arts and science very much. Uh, this, I'll just give you an example here. This is a, an installation that's been shown internationally. It's based on a paper we published in Science many years ago. Um, and so we've always actively engaged in taking what we do in the lab and looking at it in a broader context and providing uh, you know, installations like this in museums um, all over the place. OK, so you have this idea of biohacking and manipulating genetic code. And something I've been very interested in for many years now is uh, inspired by this movie. Uh, all of you sitting here right now, your bodies are extremely dynamic, even though you're hopefully awake. Um, your heart is beating, your organs are moving, there's blood flow, there's deformation, there are forces. Your body is dynamic, and it's a physical machine in many ways. And I've often wondered, can we draw an analogy between analog hacking or, or physical hacking, which is you know, hardware, screwing with components, building something, or even stealing passwords by looking over somebody's shoulder, you know, rather than uh, writing some code to steal a password. Can we draw an analogy between that and biology? Can we re-engineer, repurpose living systems using physical components? Can we mess with the componentry of an organism or an organ? Um, and the answer is actually yes, we're starting to find out. Um, these are one of these, we spend a lot of time building stuff. Um, you'll know people in my lab, their names are around on the slides. Uh, building, we build a lot of equipment to keep cells alive in situations they would not normally be alive in. Um, and we explore this idea of how do we use physical information in the cellular environment to affect cell biology. So this is something we do a lot, which is literally come and touch cells in different ways. And this is let me, I don't want to lie to you, this is an extremely complex phenomena of what's going on here, but what we're seeing is that we can start to drive cell shape. They'll change shape and move in different directions based on how and where we touch them and how hard you touch them. So this is a physical cue. There's no genetics here, there's no chemistry, we're just physically touching these cells, which kicks off a lot of signaling. I'll give you one more example um, of a physical cue. These are little grooves, and these, these grooves are three-dimensional, and they're much finer than the uh, diameter of your uh, hair. 
and we grow cells on these structures. And here's just one example of cells which are, are grown onto these grooves, and we've colored the ones in red here are the ones that are growing on top. And any cell that's green is in the bottom. And you can see these cells preferentially climb on top of the grooves. They want to be there so much that they'll even form bridges across the grooves, right? And this, again, here, all we're doing, it's, it's shape, right? It's, it's topography. It's something physical that's affecting the biology of these cells. Here's another example. These, these uh, spheroids, this is sort of a, a cross-section, a side view of, of an aggregate of, aggregate of cells. These cells will collect down at the bottom of the groove and form a three-dimensional structure, a big ball. And as we increase the size of these grooves, this ball becomes flatter and flatter and flatter. So we're just using shape, geometry, to affect this complex cell biology, which is really interesting uh, to us. And of course, uh, my lab, you know, we never do one thing. We just kind of push it and push it and push it. And uh, so we've been lately collaborating with a butcher and some colleagues around Ottawa looking for organs and meat and flesh that's going to be discarded, okay? So, I mean, rotten organs, things that are going to be thrown out. And we've been uh, using a process known as decellularization, which is essentially bathing these pieces of flesh in soap and proteases. And what this does is it pulls all the cells out of the organ, and what you're left with is a scaffold. This is a protein scaffold that retains the shape of the original structure. And where this goes, oh, well, so, just as another example, we set one of these up here last year or somewhere in Ottawa as an art installation as well, where over two days people could watch this process take place. But what you're left with, again, is a physical shape, this very complex three-dimensional environment in which cells can grow into. And so here's an, a heart, it's a mouse heart that's being decellularized, and you can imagine some really obvious applications, right? And people are doing this very well now, is, is regrowing organs, so you could put lung cells back into this organ. When we first did this, the question that came to my mind was, why do we need to put heart cells back in? Why can't we put neurons or kidneys or something else that doesn't normally uh, live in a heart? Can we repurpose and re-engineer this organ and use the shape to affect the biology? So this is one of these big questions I don't have an answer to, but I'll just go on to en end with a, an extreme example. This started out as a joke. Uh, Dan and I were joking about uh, uh, human-plant hybrids. And uh, so, of course, he took an apple. It's been decellularized. You can see there are no nuclei. There's just cell cellulose and cell walls left. And here, this is about a week later, and you can kind of see, it's not a great image, but these are mouse muscle cells growing inside of this scaffold, right? And this brings up a lot of interesting questions. Number one, it gives me an excuse to go buy an orchard. Uh, <laughs> number two, what the hell are mouse cells doing growing inside of an apple? How is that happening? How is this confinement driving their biology? There's a lot of interesting science here, and it's kind of neat. Um, so I just want to sort of get to the end here uh, and give a little plug. We are actually at Maker Faire down in the market right now. We do a lot of DIY bio. We build a lot of stuff out of garbage that you can do at home. Come and see us and talk to us. We've got a lot of equipment here, instructions on how to make it, and uh, you can take a look at this apple, uh, which has mouse cells in it and, and some other stuff. We also have free apples, if you're interested. Um, and this is all down in the Ottawa market over the weekend uh, at Shopify. And just to end, you know, as the prof, I tend to get a lot of the acknowledgement uh, for this work. And really, it's not just me. I work with an amazing team of people. Um, these guys are unbelievably dedicated and professional. They're in the labs day and night, 24-7, uh, over the weekends, over holidays. It's not unusual to get data on Christmas Day and Christmas Eve. Um, and so these guys are the drivers of the work we do together. And I really want to make this clear. You know, uh, I work with an incredible team, and I want to acknowledge their contributions to this work. So with that, thank you for your generous uh, attention, and thanks again to the organizers of this great event.